teaching this week uh, and through the Wednesday night series, I want to give you the church because I believe one of the most important things that we find in the New Testament is, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Jesus came, he left the church. This is the one thing he left behind and he left an institution. Now, it's kind of like, uh, I really like the parallel of the family because while the church is just like the human family where uh, it's, there is the family, all believers are not in a church, they're in a conglomeration of churches just like everybody's not in my family. Though I'm a family and I'm part of the human family, but each one is locally governed in everything. And we, we learned last week, we talked about the church being a called out assembly. That's what the word ecclesia means, which is where we get our word church from. It was a Greek word um, indicating that when the Greeks gathered together for human government, they were a ecclesia or a church. They, that was the word use. And so when he applied it, he said this, it's an assembly of baptized believers that gather together. And so we're going to look tonight at the message and the mission of the church because not only has what the church is been confused with things like uh, a Catholic church, which the funny thing is the word a Catholic church is an oxymoron. It means the word Catholic. Anybody know what the word Catholic means? Universal. Universal. Okay. So it means universal assembly. Now think about this. Does that work? How can something be universal in an assembly? You can't assemble universe. You know, it's, it, it doesn't work. And it, it's at, so what we learned was, is okay, there's a lot of things out there being taught as being the church and masquerading as the church and the church getting blamed for it they say oh well the church is doing this well no the church isn't doing that something that calls itself the church it's like the, the church of scientology or the church of satan okay well just because they stole the name i heard one guy say one time he says change your doctrine or change your name you know and uh, uh, i think uh, it should be that is uh, you know they've stolen a good name it's like some people have stolen the word gay it used to mean happy <laughs> you know, they, so the, what you do is if you can't beat them, you redefine the terms and everything. So we're going to look tonight at the mission and the message of the church, because unless you understand that, you won't be able to define a church because its mission and its message defines it. It tells you what it is by what you see. So uh, let's go to Mark, take your Bible to Mark chapter 16. Uh, turn there with me. Chapter 16, last chapter in the book of Mark, Jesus is concluding his earthly ministries. He's got the disciples all gathered around him. And not only disciples, but he actually has the 11, 11 apostles gathered around him. And that's critical to note because what he says to them is not necessarily... Now, it applies to us in a way, but there's a couple things later on in the passage that, don't apply, that apply to them. But... This is the message that he's giving and the charge he's giving to them. Because remember, we learned last week that uh, he said in the church, first apostles, they were the foundation. In fact, in Revelation, you'll see that they are the cornerstones of the new Jerusalem. They're the foundations of the new Jerusalem is the apostles. And uh, that's what it's built upon. And so he took them. He empowered them. They had special gifts that the rest of us don't have, by the way. And it was called, Paul called about called it the mark of the apostles. How could you tell an apostle? Because he could do things that other people couldn't do. And he, he could speak things. But as he's dealing with them, because remember, they're the foundation of the church. He says here in chapter 16 of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, he says, and he said unto them, okay, the 12, the 12 or the 11 at this time, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this, you know, it's kind of like he, he summarizes it right at the beginning. He kind of says, okay, 
here is your objective, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's your job. Now, all the other things we do circles around that one thing. You say, what's the mission of the church? That's the mission of the church right there. Now, we're going to do a lot of other things to accomplish this. But this is our mission statement, if you will. You know, nowadays, everybody in business writes a mission statement and everything. This is it. This is our mission statement, if you will. And, uh, and uh, as he gets them out there, he's going to send them out. He says, go into all the world. And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's why we call that the great what? The great commission. Did you ever think about that word commission? Do you ever think of what the word commission means? Co mission. Co it means that we have a co mission. We're joined together with somebody. Who are we joined together with? With Christ. Lo, I am with you always. It's called the Great Commission because he's saying, you go and I'll go with you. And so we go two by two, even if we're going alone, physically, we have the Lord with us. And he said, and lo, I am with you always. I'm going to be with you. And that's why it's a commission because he didn't send us out on a mission. The, you know, the Mormons send their boys out on a mission. Uh, we go on commissions. Okay, so we, we have a different attitude. Why? Because we have the Lord with us. Okay, there we go. So Matthew 28, turn over there with me if you would. So we have an institution, the foundations, the apostles. We have a message uh, to go into all the world. That's our mission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, our, that's our mission. Our message is the gospel. Okay, close. Uh, the, the gospel, that's our gospel message. Yes, the Bible is the text and the found, you know, what we build upon. But what one message, because we can't teach them all the Bible at once, but we go out there. We're going to see the second part of it where we're going to use all the Bible after this. So what we have is the mission is to go into all the world. The message is the gospel. What is the gospel? Simple. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, providing salvation by grace through faith. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's the message of the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And he provided this salvation. So here we have in Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore... And teach all nations. Okay, once you teach them the gospel, the message, you baptize them, them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All right? So we're supposed to go out there. Now, does baptism save them? No. But what it does, uh, you know what I always find is it usually defines whether a person is a Christian. Now, it doesn't make them a Christian. It doesn't prove they're a Christian. But I find this, that first of all, people who won't get baptized usually aren't saved. Now, there's some people who haven't had the opportunity, but people who refuse it, usually it's because, oh, oh why do I have to do that? I, I don't want to do that. What it is, it's kind of like when you join the army, a guy joins the army and says, they said, okay, will you put, here's the uniform shop. Why not to put that on? I don't want it. Hey, everybody will know I'm in the army then. Yeah. You know why you get baptized? To show forth the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's what baptism is. Death. It shows forth that. Who does you show it forth? Now, I have a little problem, frankly, with our churches. Because most Baptist churches have a baptistry right here in front of the church. Now, that's all great, but baptism to me is to be a testimony to the world. We baptized at sunshine on the, at the ocean at Golden Beach. Well, before the, we did there, we, when we were at the school, we actually did it in the what's now the Grand Canal at Kiwana. It used to be a slough hole. 
<laughs> you know, a, a mud pond and everything, but it was right across the road from the church. But we'd go out in public. But I really liked Golden Beach because we'd have people out there standing, watching what we were doing. But it says, I am a Christian. I'm identifying with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It's a public testimony of what inwardly happened. It doesn't do anything else, but does that. And this was the commandment of the Lord for them not only to preach the gospel message, but then to baptize them. Why? Because it would identify and bring a public testimony to the community that that's what they were. And so baptism is important not because it saves you or keeps you or holds you or makes you. My grandfather was 91 when I led him to the Lord. He never did get baptized. He lived to be 99. But you know what? He's, not, he's still saved. Okay? He's still saved. Somebody, I asked him, Pop, why didn't, why didn't you ever get saved before? And he said, no one ever explained it to me. I thought, wow. Now, I, I think probably he had, it had been explained, but he maybe didn't hear it at that time or whatever. But, because he had actually heard Billy Sunday preach. <laughs> uh huh? <laughs> he couldn't miss it on Billy Sunday. So, you know, so, um, but he was probably at an age and young and, you know, didn't, didn't hear. But uh, having ears, they hear not. Having eyes, they see not, you know, at that time. But praise the Lord, he lived to be 91 and I could witness to him and lead him to Christ. So let the word of Christ uh, go to, um, over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Because not only is it a message, and it's uh, a uh, baptism where we identify with Christ, that we're supposed to teach people to identify with him. And, uh, of course, what, has a, what a lot of churches, and I use that in quotes, that churches do is, of course, they have baptism where they sprinkle people. Well, the word baptism is a transliteration of the Greek, baptizo, which means to immerse. I always call it, a lot of churches, dry clean. They, they, <laughs> it's a dry cleaning version. It, but it's not a baptism because they do it before the person is saved. Real, and this is where, remember, I told you they took the word church and use it differently. They, took the, they take the word baptism and they apply it to taking a little baby and sprinkling some water on it. Well, first of all, baptism is subsequent to salvation. You get saved and then baptized. You don't get baptized and then years later get saved. Because that hasn't happened in your life yet. Now what do we do at our church? Well, we dedicate our children. If we have a child, we may dedicate them to the Lord to train them up. And that's just a commitment on our part. But that child doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't need to be baptized. You get baptized and you find that. You say, well, how do you know it's afterwards? Well, because in the Philippian jailer's case, uh, or was it? No, it wasn't the Philippian jailer. Who said, what doth hinder me there for be baptized? He said, if thou believest, thou may. Huh? The eunuch. The eunuch, yeah, Ethiopian eunuch, yeah. And um, so we find that baptism is subsequent to salvation. So we have the message first, then we have the salvation, sec we have the salvation and then the baptism. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Okay, this is what's to go on in the church. This is the operation in the church. He says uh, that the word of God dwell in us and then we're to be teaching and admonishing and encouraging one another. We're to be worshiping the Lord. We're to be singing and everything. Why? Because it's a time to gather together and worship the Lord and honor Him. It's a time to learn about Him. It's a time to admonish each other to do right and to live right and everything. That's what we're to be doing in here. We're to be encouraging one another. And each one of you has a ministry like that. Each one of you has a responsibility in that. Uh, Rivo and I were talking about this and how important it is that Everybody is serving the Lord to their maximum ability. Now, the Bible talks about spiritual gifts, and each one has it. And the, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, it says, And the Lord set in the church 
and he, he gave the spiritual gifts of these people. And some, there's some pastors and teachers and exhorters. And uh, if I get a chance, I, I may go through that and, and do a little message on that one here. I may, because I think I have five weeks here before pastor gets back. But all these spiritual gifts, some are mercy showers, some are uh, have different ministries. You know, each one of you are different, and, and that's good. In fact, if you were all the same, it would really be a boring church. And it would be a very, uh, a church filled with a lot of friction. Because you notice people don't marry somebody like them? Because when you have somebody like you, you rub each other the wrong way. <laughs> you need somebody that compliments you. You know, somebody who's different than you. You need opposites attract for a reason, okay? You don't have two negative poles on a magnet. You don't have, you put two people and uh, I can think of a couple that they were both type A personalities. And they had a lot of kids and they had a lot of fights and they are not married anymore. <laughs> Because the, you know, it's the irresistible force meeting the immovable object. God set in his church the way he wants, and he puts in people with different gifts and talents. Now, your job is to see the scriptures, and I'll do a little teaching on that, maybe the, maybe the last one or so. You need to find out what your spiritual gift is. If you've never done this, you need to go through the Bible. We'll look at the spiritual gifts and see which one it is. You need to find what spiritual gift you have, and then develop that spiritual gift some of you are teachers some of you are exhorters or you know some of you are counselors some of you are mercy showers you know hey, my spiritual gift is not mercy showing uh, had a lady in the church up at sunshine she's passed away and she was a nurse and when she was she wasn't quite sickly and she was in the hospital quite a few times and i'd come there and she looked at me one day and says you hate this, don't you? And I said, yes. Hospital visits and me, you might, you know, hey, drag me through, the, through some broken glass and everything, I'll enjoy it more. I, I do not like visiting hospitals, but as a pastor, you gotta do it. You know, that's one of those things you can't avoid it. And we've had to go up and see June and everything, and it, it's hard, I'm just as uncomfortable. Now, I have a pastor friend in the States. He built his, a church of 800 people, and he would be out three and four days at hospital visits, and that's how he built his church. People were sick. He laid them to the Lord. He'd lead their family standing there to the Lord. He had a church full of people. He asked, where would you get saved? At the hospital. It, it, that was his, but see, he had, that was his spiritual gift. Now, I'll, I'll reach people other ways. We re, we've reached a lot of our neighbors and everything, so I'm kind of excited. We've already met a couple of our new neighbors and everything. We've already invited the one lady to church. She didn't go to church, but we'll, we'll get her there eventually. You know? and, but God will use you, but you need to find out what your spiritual gift is and develop it. If you're a teacher, learn to teach. Obviously, if you're going to be a teacher, you'd better know something to teach, okay? <laughs> it doesn't take ignorant people and make them teachers. They teach people who learn or are learners and things like this. Some are exhorters. Some are the ones that walk alongside and know, brother, you know, it would really help you if you did this, this, and this. Oh. You know, and they just have a knack for summarizing things and helping people that way. Everybody's there. Some are evangelists. Some are prophets and go, thus saith the Lord, get your heart right with God. You know, you think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's a guy those guys usually don't make good pastors because they scare everybody off before they get them but there's usually a guy in the church that man it, if God is on the throne he's going to fight for him you know it's kind of like oh I'll get him so we, we have to look at the spiritual gifts and realize each one of us has one okay then um, singing making melody hearts of the Lord go to 2 Timothy not too far away there 2 Timothy chapter 4 so we're to use those spiritual gifts to build everybody up in the house of God. This is our mission and our message. We're, and we're going to use the word of God, as Dell said. We're going to use the word of God to build each other up. You know, it's not man's wisdom. It's not earthly wisdom that we use. And this is why we need to study the word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 2, 
Now, Paul's speaking to young Timothy, a young preacher boy that's just cutting his teeth, and he admonishes him. He says, preach the word. Be instant. In other words, be always, just always be ready, always prepared, in season and out of season. So it doesn't matter whether you, know, you feel like it or you don't, or you're having a good day or a bad day. He said, always be instant, always be ready, no matter how it is. And he said, these are the things you need to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay, so he's going to reprove. Now, if there's sin, we have to be willing to name it. Uh, we live in a day and age where, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. No, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. We're, both, we're all bad. So first of all, it's not a judgment that I'm better than you. What it is is saying is, Here's how we're both messing up. But here's how I specifically see you messing up. You know what? And you're going to see things how I'm messing up. In the church, we got to have a humble enough heart that realizes that, you know, somebody can tell us, you know what? Brother, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> you, you need to really think twice about doing that. You're, and being reproved isn't, and rebuking is very similar. And uh, folks, being rebuked is not fun. But we have to have a humble enough heart to realize, let me ask, anybody got it all together? <laughs> no hands. I can't believe this. None of you have it all together. I thought you all were really had it locked in. No, we don't, do we? Never. Now, huh? Never will. Never will. But you know what? That needs to be our goal. He said, be perfect as I am perfect. And mature, and the word perfect there means mature, the idea of maturity coming to perfection, you know, so that something that's mature. A cheese perfects, yes, with time, okay? We need to grow in the Lord. Exhort. That, that's more of a positive one where, you know, do this, this, and this this week. You know, or do this this week. You know, I don't just give you one thing. You know, I don't want you to do five. Just do one, you know. The exhorter usually has three points, so that's, uh, you got to know that one, okay? And then he said, notice how you do it with all long suffering. You know what, the first time you exhort somebody, they won't do it. <laughs> and uh, you just keep encouraging people. Exhortation is encouraging people to do right. Just keep exhorting them. Be long suffering. The Lord's long suffering. He's been so long suffering with you. You can be long suffering with others. He said with long suffering with doctrine. Doctrine, I always say doctrine is what we believe that we do. Uh, the first two letters of doctrine is do. Yeah, and doctrine is something you should do. So he said, take the word of God and apply that. Now, remember, don't try to get everybody to do your opinion. Try to get everybody to do the word of God. That's, that's how we do it. Okay, so let's get that done. Okay, so exhorting, worshiping together. I, I, nothing is more powerful than worshiping together really getting together and singing unto the Lord and praying together and, and doing those things. And hey, how do, you, how do you worship? Well, you can worship in giving. You can worship in singing. You can worship in praying. You can worship in preaching. You can worship the Lord. All those things ought to get us to be looking to Jesus. That's what they ought to be doing. So let's do that. Then go over to Hebrews chapter 10, if you would. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about the church now you know one of the things that always challenges me and we're you know we're working on it and every church grows on it and we probably have the lowest crowd we've had in a while here on a wednesday night so it's kind of funny because you're the one people who don't need to hear this first but everybody else who's not here needs to hear it okay but uh very familiar passage hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 it says not forsaking the assemblings of yourselves together as the manner a sum is, but exhorting one another, uh, uh, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, the day of the Lord's coming, approaching. I think the Lord's coming. Folks, you know why people need to be in church? Because the devil is fighting overtime to get you to not walk with God. I mean, all you got to do is go out there in the world and you're going to have all kinds of battles to get you not to be here. 
It's amazing how people, uh, you can find every excuse in the book, and you can have every reason and everything. You know why? Hey, like, hey, I preached 7,000 messages or taught, taught or preached 7,000 messages in my life. But if you notice, Paul and I make it pretty much every service that we can. You say, well, what are you learning new? I need to be encouraged in the Lord. I, why? Because the devil's fighting me just like he's fighting you. It is not like I'm going to get, you know, hey, I always count it good. I, I heard one fellow say one time, I think it was Zig Ziglar said to W.A. Criswell, pastor of First Baptist Dallas, great big church in America. Um, and he said, hey, congratulations, pastor. He said, you got my attention six times this morning. <laughs> Hey, I've heard just about every illustration. Uh, every once in a while I hear a new one, you know, and I've heard a lot of them a hundred times. And I've heard, you know, most every text preached. But you know what? The Lord will use the pastor and he'll give him something and he probably won't even know why he gave it. And sometimes I have to laugh because he'll read a passage and I'll read the passage with him and I'll keep on reading. I'll read the next verse. And that next verse after he quit is the one that the Lord used to encourage me for the whole day. And it was kind of like, wow, how'd that happen? Well, see, if I hadn't been here, I wouldn't have read that verse today. And God will use us. And God will use you. And you know what sometimes the most important thing is? Is that when someone else comes, they see you here. They, they expect the pastor to be here. They expect maybe... Paul and I to be here, but they know you're here. Wow, that's good. That's good. You know, sometimes you are the one they're looking for. Huh? Who's you? You. <laughs> hey, you. They're looking, they're all, someone is looking to you. Everybody is being looked at by someone everybody's looking at by someone it may be your neighbor they're watching to see you drive out the driveway it's ama amazing how much neighbors know <laughs> they say oh are you okay i didn't see didn't see you guys leave for uh, were you out of town last week what they're saying is we didn't see you leave for church last sunday morning Okay, why? They're watching. They, you know, sometimes they'll watch you for 30 years, but they're watching. It's a testimony. It's important. It's, it's important to be there. The older to teach the younger. And I'll, I'll go up to examples uh, to the flock. P, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5 and verse 3. I won't keep us much longer here. Okay, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3 says, you don't even have to turn there, I'll read it. It says, um, neither as being um, lords over God's heritage, but being example and samples to the flock. You know, uh, as our pastor and the leadership of the church, we're not to be lords over God's heritage. God didn't make us dictator of the, the flock. He said, we're to be examples. He said, he that would be chief amongst you must be your servant. We got a great pastor. He doesn't try to dictate to you. But because he doesn't dictate you, don't consider it any less that he is the one pastor has put to lead us. The servant leader. And a lot of people struggle with that. You know, it's kind of like, I won't follow somebody that doesn't tell me what to do. Well, he's telling you what to do, but he's doing it by showing you an example. So you've got to be smart enough to say, hmm, pastor does that that's a good example i'm i need to follow that i need to follow that follow those are good examples you know it's kind of like <laughs> people complain if the guy's a dictator and they play, complain if he doesn't stand up and tell them what to do all right you know it's like what god one little sunday school kid said you know god, one thing god can't do is god can't make everybody happy you know and neither can the pastor okay so we're to send we ha the church has the authority to send out people the missionaries, you know, I've seen people say, oh, well, I'm just going to go do this. 
Well, first of all, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, and so give I unto you. The word power there is the word authority. Jesus had all the authority from the Heavenly Father, and he gave it to the 12 to, as the church. He said, I'm giving you, the church, the authority. The authority to do the work of the missions and the gospel and everything else comes through the New Testament church. You're not the Lone Ranger. You don't just go out and do your own thing and say, oh, I'm just doing my own thing. I run into people like this. You know, they're out there winging it, doing their own thing. The reason is, is God's saying, okay, I give the church. Now, what does the church do? It says, okay, I look at you. Okay, um, we're going to send you out. So what did we do? We sent the Dawsons out to start a church. We gave them authority to do that. They have no authority. You don't have authority to go out and start a church of your own. Don't call it a church if you do do something. You know Why? Because you have no authority to. Churches are started from churches. And authority to go out and do ministry comes from the church. We put the blessing for Taz to go up and minister up there. Send each other out. Send them out. Do the work. Why? Because also... Do we want to send out somebody who doesn't know what they're doing? Do we want to send somebody out that doesn't, isn't teaching the right doctrine? No. It's a control over that. So somebody isn't teaching falsehoods. You find most of your cults are people who got kicked out of some other church because of their false doctrine. They got kicked out of a group. You go back and study their history, and all of a sudden you'll find out, oh, they came out of this group, but they, got, they kicked them out because they were causing trouble and doing this and teaching these false doctrines. So because they couldn't do it, instead of submitting unto the authority of the church, they went out and started their own with no authority. They just did their own thing. So be careful. The mission and the message comes from the church, and has the authority is there a gospel message the leadership and um, was the apostles and the prophets uh, the gifts were put in the church new testament authority and let's see in operation and obedience uh, the people are to practice do the doctrine do the baptizing that's why baptism needs to be done in a, from a local church the authority of a local church where does pastor get his authority? The local church. He says, sometimes I've done the baptizing. Why? Because of the authority of the church, not my authority. You can't go out and just baptize somebody because you think it'd be a neat idea. You need to have the authority of the church. Now, if you're out doing some outback ministry and we say, hey, and if you get somebody saved, they can come. But you know what? They become a member of this church. Why? Because there needs to be church authority because it's about the doctrine of the church as well. The Lord's Supper. Why do we only give the Lord's Supper to members? Because of authority. We only have authority to give it to our members. We don't have authority to give it to just anybody who walks in off the street. Not only does authority control you, it almost also limits you. We have no jurisdiction because think, they told him, well, if somebody's misbehaving, you're not supposed to have the Lord's Supper with them, right? Well, how can you discipline somebody who's not a member of your church? You can't. Therefore, you have no authority to give them the Lord's Supper if they're not a member of your church either. So that's why we practice closed communion, by the way. All right, we're going to stop right there tonight. I've got lots more to say, but I won't say it tonight. Okay, I, okay, let's see, that's week three. I put in notes, otherwise I forget where I stopped. Okay. All right. Prayer requests tonight. Prayer requests. Um, pray for June.